very much. Uh, I'm Tom Walsh. I'm a senior researcher in our uh, NLP team here at Snorkel AI, and I've been with the company for about six months. Uh, I'm predominantly looking at how we can make uh, fine-tuning and alignment more programmatic. How can we approach it like we do software development to do it at scale? So today is all about fine-tuning, and we're going to start with you know when and why should you fine-tune an LLM? It's not applicable in every scenario, but we want to start with outlining the scenarios where it is applicable. We're then going to move on to talk about the how. What techniques can we use to fine-tune LLMs, and how can we start thinking about the data required to do so? So to start with, you know, when and why. Where should you use fine-tuning, and, and when should you start thinking about it? For a lot of tasks, off-the-shelf models can do pretty well in generalist use cases. However, when you're looking at enterprise use cases, we think, you know, coming from a generalist off-the-shelf model, you really need to specialize it to get those accuracy gains that take the performance above a threshold that's acceptable. And we see fine-tuning as sort of part of the puzzle to help increase this downstream accuracy and to help adapt the models to very specialized tasks or domains where sort of web-scale data doesn't really get you the performance you want. Not only are we looking at accuracy on specific tasks, but we're looking to fine-tune and improve models with respect to user preferences, those that are internal users or public-facing users. And all of this comes under the umbrella of enhanced usability. We want to build systems that are useful, appropriate within enterprise contexts, and have the relevant contextual information to be safe, compliant, and performant. There was a great piece of work by Predibase recently about the advantages of fine-tuning versus just using off-the-shelf models. You can see some of the results they got here, and I recommend reading Laura Land's their technical report for sort of more in-depth analysis. But they were testing LLMs, off-the-shelf models, uh, open source and proprietary across 31 tasks. Their interest was fine-tuning small LLMs as well. What you can see here is going from the base model to the fine-tuned model, we see huge increases in performance such that they match the performance of the off-the-shelf proprietary models. Fine-tuning not only allows you to increase the accuracy of your models, but it allows you to use smaller models, which are easier to host and far cheaper. That's part of the motivation about why we want to focus on fine-tuning to increase model performance and make it easier to curate the data for it in-house. But when should you fine-tune an LLM? Because you probably aren't going to do it in every scenario, and you certainly shouldn't start with it. I've got here quite a simplified LLM ops pipeline. Starting from the left, you have your users. The users will put in prompts, maybe instructions, questions into a system. Retrieval augmented generation, or RAG, is a, is a very vital technique to help bring in external live context into that prompt. So perhaps you're retrieving over documents you want to ask questions over. Perhaps you want to bring in the most relevant current news, stuff that not, may not necessarily be in the knowledge of the LLM. After RAG, you have a prompt, but you may want to tweak the system prompt to improve task-specific performance. You can add very fine-grained instructions or guidelines. So at this point, we have some systems that occur before we've even reached the LLM. And then we put the prompt into the LLM, we generate our response, and maybe that response is great, but if it's not, how do we start thinking about where it's failed? So we are thinking about this in sort of two dominant error modes. The first is pre-LLM in terms of retrieval errors. Maybe your RAG system isn't perfect. Maybe it's not retrieving using particularly accurate representations of your domain knowledge, or maybe it's not tuned for a task or generation errors, which occur during the generation process where your LLM has the perfect context, but for some reason, it's not generating responses that are up to your standard. It's failing on your evaluations. But where we see fine tuning for the LLM uh, and its successes is in this reduction of generation errors. So when to fine tune an LLM is when you want to tackle problems in generation. But we think you should start with prompt engineering. It doesn't require any fine tuning or, or uh, modification of model weights. Then you should start with RAG if it's applicable. And then finally, if you're still getting those generation errors, the final piece in the puzzle is to, is to tackle LLM based fine tuning. So that's when you should think about it and how you might go about it. But these, these are now the techniques you'll 
you'll use in production. And after talking about some of the techniques, we'll go on to some of the data considerations. This is a, a great diagram by Meta from their Llama 2 paper. And it goes through the different phases that people generally talk about when they are talking about training an LLM. Looking at the bottom left, we start off with a randomly initialized model. It has no use at this point at all. And we have access to a very large, unsupervised, unstructured uh, collection of text. So this is your web scale data. This could be millions of documents. And through self-supervised learning, we can pre-train the model. This is the next token prediction. So we're not going to cover pre-training today. We're going to focus on what you can do with pre-trained models. Pre-training is very, very expensive. And, uh, and typically, your best sort of cost to performance is achieved by taking an off-the-shelf model, so a generalist model, and adapting it for your downstream tasks. So when you have your pre-trained model, now we focus on the right-hand side, fine-tuning the model is typically done in two stages. You may start off with supervised fine-tuning, otherwise called uh, instruction tuning, and then maybe you're going on to more advanced alignment techniques, such as reinforcement learning from human feedback, or uh, some preference optimization techniques like DPO. So we see training being a three-stage pipeline, starting with pre-training, and then you can decompose the next two steps into fine-tuning and then further alignment. For the supervised stages of that pipeline, we have different data requirements. So I'll just highlight these here. Supervised fine-tuning or instruction tuning is where you have instruction response pairs. For a range of prompts or instructions or questions, you ideally have a gold standard set of how you want the LLM to respond. For example, you could have long documents that you have had an analyst write summaries for. High quality, typically it's been human uh, annotated data, but there are programmatic methods we'll talk about later on. But this is to help guide the LLM and set the format of the responses you want. Preference optimization goes beyond that. For your instructions or prompts, you're looking at pairs of responses. And the idea is you have responses that are preferred. These exhibit the behaviors you want. Perhaps it's stylistic, it's the tone or the formatting. And then you have dispreferred responses. The idea here is you're trying to guide the LLM through optimization of its weights towards the preferred responses and away from the, the dispreferred ones. So those are your two data formats that we'll be focusing on today. With Supervised fine tuning, the supervision signal itself comes directly from the instruction response pairs. We put in the prompt to the LLM, and then we look at the first token that it's predicting. And we compare that to the actual token in the gold standard response. Token by token, we do this optimization. And the idea here is we want the model to accurately understand uh, the relationship between the instruction and the response and how to follow these specific instructions. Through generalization as well, we hope that it's able to address tasks or problems beyond its uh, supervised fine-tuning data set. RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback, works on a very different paradigm. Separate to training the weights of the LLM, what we need is a reward model. So the supervision signal comes from a model that can determine the quality and assign rewards for those responses from an LLM. And what we want to do using algorithms like PPO is adjust the weights of the LLM to increase the expected reward over time. The idea is that the reward model encodes some human values or preference. For example, higher reward could be associated with more harmless outputs. And we want our model through maximizing its rewards to be aligned with those harmless responses. And then building that reward model or quality model requires a lot of human feedback. We take uh, our instruction set, we generate lots and lots of responses. Maybe these can also be human generated. And we ask annotators or we use model feedback to rank them. And we have then a preference data set. From this preference data set, we train a reward model. This is typically a smaller model than the LLM you want to train. But the idea is for an instruction and a given response, it's able to assign a scalar score for them, or it could give binary feedback. Using uh, this offline reinforcement learning pipeline, this is where we actually change the weights of the LLM. We have our instructions. Our LLM generates a response. We understand how good that response is. 
and then we optimize the model using, say, PPO. And we do this iteratively. So your LLM updates over time. Your reward model is typically frozen. And we, say, converge on a model, on a model that is better with respect to whatever quality metrics we're uh, trying to instill in our reward model. The downside with uh, RLHF is it requires you to have a reward model. So those are quite expensive to build, and there are some problems to do with overfitting to reward models. And that sort of offline reinforcing pipeline is very expensive. You have to iteratively update your LLM, produce new responses, score them, and update. DPO, direct preference optimization, is a technique that came out of Stanford last year. And instead of optimizing first a reward model and then your LLM, they wanted to address the question of why can't you use your preference data to directly optimize the LLM? You know what's good, you know what's bad in terms of responses. There must be some supervision signal there you can use directly. And what they found is they can uh, optimize the model. And there's, it's, it has its own implicit reward signal based on the likelihood of a response being generated. So through direct optimization, what DPO is trying to do is increase the likelihood of good responses, so chosen responses, re responses that meet your criteria, and reduce the likelihood of bad responses, so negative responses, toxic responses, whatever preference you've encoded in your preference data set. And then when compared to RLHF, this method can be more stable, it's certainly more simple, and it avoids the need to train a separate reward model. And then looking at some sort of more recent methods, these are ones we've been looking at in research. First, we have KTO. This is inspired by prospect theory in economics, which focuses on how humans perceive utility. So for your instruction response pairs, so we just need the two, we understand if a response is good or bad using a binary label. And using KTO, we can then use that to optimize the model. And the authors found that this is more robust to label noise than DPO. ORPO is a, a different technique. So that stands for Odds Ratio Preference Optimization. You may remember earlier when I was talking about Llama 2 that a typical pipeline involves, say, supervised fine tuning and then separately some sort of preference optimization. The authors of ORPO found that it was much more computationally efficient to combine these steps together. So you have a single loss function with two components. And they found that not only is this more computationally efficient, but it can outperform techniques such as DPO in some benchmarks. Before I move on to the data side, I wanted to just share sort of one lesson we learned earlier in the year. And you can read about this more on our blog post. Huang in our research team wrote about alpaca eval and you know why we got to the top of the leaderboard, but why we're not there anymore. So in this experiment, we wanted to use reward models to provide signals to generate preference data sets. Chosen rewards should have a high score, rejected rewards should have a low score, and then we can use that for DPO rather than RLHF. However, with reward models, you have the risk of overfitting to them. The reward models are very imperfect. They are an imperfect representation of what a human would assign. And we found that our reward model really liked long responses. Our responses weren't getting better over time if a human were to look at them, but they were getting longer. And when using LLM as a judge, the score would go up, but it didn't correlate with what a human annotator would assign to uh, the quality of the responses. So yeah, one lesson we've learned is uh, never fully trust your reward model. So now to move on to the training data portion, how can we do this programmatically? Well, how can we start thinking about doing this programmatically? Generalist off-the-shelf models, as I mentioned at the start, are a good baseline, but can underperform when you're using your private data, say data bought in with a RAG system, or they can underperform on specific tasks. Or maybe the guard railing that they're instilled with doesn't meet your requirements for either safety or compliance. We want to understand best how we can specialize LLMs uh, to be task and domain specific. And that usually requires transforming unstructured data into this structured form that we saw earlier for LLM training. But in enterprise, it's going to be very typical that your SMEs that can understand the data and that can annotate it correctly are going to be very expensive to use for manual annotation. It's also going to be very slow. Our work here at Snorkel is all about how can we think about programmatic approaches to leverage SMEs to do annotation scalably 
And this is in the context of both Gen AI training and providing data for evaluation data sets. To briefly cover the data requirements for each of these fine tuning techniques, for supervised fine tuning, we found that having a diverse set of prompts and instructions is a vital first step. So this is before you consider the responses, focus on your instructions. A diverse instruction set that is representative of your downstream task is a good starting point. For the gold standard responses, the slowest way would be to use an annotator to, to manually write them. A quicker way using weak supervision could be a model writes them and then you have some heuristics to filter them out by quality. You have a quality model there. Or you can use techniques like Benito. Benito was a research paper published last year, which turns unstructured data into supervised tuning data sets. And then another caveat we found is that data should be consistent in tone, style, or format. It's easiest to get consistent outputs when you have consistent inputs. Uh, for RLHF and DPO, uh, again, diverse instructions are very important. But when you're coming up with preferences, we found it's very important to have very clear dimensions that you're trying to assess a preference over. For example, using a specific dimension such as clarity is better than say, you know, pick which one is better across all dimensions. But if your dimension is quite subjective, we can end up with a lot of noise in our data set. So having well-defined preference dimensions, we, we think is the way forward to having better preference data sets and better outcomes for uh, alignment. And the final thing is where you have humans or models creating these rankings, it's very important to avoid encoding human or model bias into them. For example, earlier, if you were to use the reward model that we had to rank responses, you might find the longer responses are always more preferred independent of their content. So I've got some quite quick lessons learned here. We've found and we've always believed that high quality, low noise data is better than large noisy data sets. And then when we're talking about supervised data sets, so either instruction response pairs or instruction preference pairs, it's important to identify those spurious correlations or surface features that bias the data. For example, it may be length bias. It may be biased towards certain companies or individuals. And using your SMEs to evaluate your data and then correct for those biases is an essential part of this iterative data development process. And we think that feeds into robust or, or the need for robust error mode analysis. And part of that is using your SMEs to define fine-grained slices of your data to understand if those biases exist and if your actions are reducing those biases through uh, your evaluation processes.